Okay, I'm already trying to link to the YouTube. And today I'm going to present the uh, genetic modulation of ion channels by photoreceptive proteins. Actually, during when I go through this chapter, I'm a little confusing with one figure. And I always ask ask the author through the email. Um, so today I'm still going to present it on with, with my understanding. And, and my understanding is consistent with the writings of this chapter. So, and uh, well, it's a very nice, nice springtime and there's some some runnings in Michigan now. Um, I already tried to reach to the authors of these books. Um, well, I hopefully they will give like, like a positive um, kind of like a support to me, but um, but for myself, so after prepare for these lectures, I learn a lot, especially like some sometimes when you see like a like chemical chemical structures or chemical molecules, I just only like read it. I know that like a CO like O two like SO four. I know that I know what is that's all. But after preparing this lecture, I noticed that then I have to call them like a sulfate, highlight. Yeah, it's a, I really make like learn something with not only like reading this book, but also like prepare for these studies. Now I can hear my voice, so let's start and yes today is lecture five so generally for this lecture this um today we i will mention a little bit of the channel adopting advantage and disadvantage then talking about some examples of those options that can ca can coupled with GQ, GI, or GS, and and then mentioned uh, genetic engineering that combine a uh, combined a uh, G protein coupled receptor on the cytosol part of the uh, sequence, then um, change the to the opsin, then then generate a new chimera that it can be activated um, by light rather than the previous ligand of the G protein coupled receptor. So key point of the channel adoption functional is that it's a uh, um, most of them, although it's a cation channels. The proton's permeability is the highest among all the cations. And some of them are uh, calcium permeable, and some of them are sodium permeable, but proton is, um, is, the, is the still the most uh, with some highest influx like amount. That's, so that will change the pH of the intracellular, right? And so during for all this study focused to generate more tours of the optogenetics and people find that it's quite difficult to find some channels that for the calcium inflow or to activate potassium channels. Then the scientists will switch to another approach because some channels like like uh like a grrk we will mention that in later in this lecture and it was coupled it was activated by by 
cute little little jazz. And like another channel, like TRP channels, that's for sure that it will be activated by GQ, uh, like G protein signal cascade. So scientists will switch the strategy that are looking for like the G protein coupled, coupled like this property to open like a calcium channel or potassium channel. So here, for example, this here, they show like the R type of photoreceptor and the C type of photoreceptor. So there's a, there's a like a morphology difference between this, this rhabdomeric photoreceptor and compared to the ciliary receptor. But the endogenous, like the signal pathway were also different. For R type of photoreceptor, these this opsins were activate a GQ the signal pathway. And this, but for like the C type of photoreceptor, that's, that's the same as like a human beings. And actually it's activated as a GI signal pathway. So for the R type, then you will activate the, the PLC. And, and I will draw, um, use this diagram to show that the PLC and it will, it will hydrolyze the PIP2 to IP3 and, and a membrane binding the DAG. And the DAG will, come, will undergo like some change to the PUFA, then open the TRP channel. And TRP channel is um, cation channels. And that's in R type photoreceptor. And which is different that in, in the C type photoreceptor, that it's a GI and it will close the saccharin G. A CNG channel and cause the membrane potential to be more hyperized, uh, to be more hyperparized and to be more negative, in the membrane potential. And that's a difference with the R type. So, to further to activate the target cells, so people like thinking about like applied other like options that are from the from this from this group like the R type of photoreceptor. So in table one, and the author that at least a lot of like G protein coupled, uh, the options that it can open like, like a potassium, potassium channel, GRK, or voltage gated calcium channel. And the two that like a PQ1, and that's, uh, and also some, that like a uh, flavine that's uh, based on photoreceptor proteins, it can, it can, um, it can the effector channels will be like the L type CAV1 voltage to get it calcium channel. So for the downstream signal of the G protein coupled receptors, there's a huge group of family and different choices. So for example, there's like a GAs, GI, GQ, and the G12. For the GS, the GQ, and the, it will increase like the saccharine GMP concentration and increase the calcium. And then for GI, it will decrease saccharine AMP and activate a phosphodiesterase. And the some, some downstream, this signal where it goes to, to like some beta subunit or like a G, G12 and it will go into the nucleus and then even turn on the gene expression of this um, of as a like a downstream signal that's induced by the G protein coupled receptor. So here, and this, and this diagram I just showed in in previous lecture, and the major point that, like for the animals, the rhodopsin, you most of them are binding the basis retinol. After capturing the light, it goes to all trans retinol, and for like for like the microbian, and those channel rhodopsins, it's mostly binding the all trans retinol. Then after capture right, it will switch confirmation to 11 cis retinol. And later we'll also discuss about that some options were binding to 9 cis, then switch to 13 cis and other several types. But the major point that because for the 11 cis retinol, it's not like, like everywhere in a human body. 
but is it the same, not the same case as the all trans retinol? All trans retinol in the human body is everywhere in the body fluid. So it's available at many different parts of our body. So those opsins that can bind into all trans retinol, and that will be a potential optogenetic source because it can like function um, somewhere else um, without without the required of like RPE cells. So here is the chemical structure of the retinal isomers. So talking about the retinal cycle is we are talking about like like in like mammalian eyes, like for like in human eyes, after capture of photon and opsins binding the elemases will switch to all trans retinol and it will dissociate with the opsin and it will be transported out of the photoreceptor and transported into the ret retinal pigmental epithelium. Then within another cell type, then with other several different enzyme works, then we we'll switch all this all trans retinol to go back to 11 cis retinol, then transport back into the photoreceptor. So this function requires the photoreceptor and also requires the RPE cells. But in many in many other different tissues, let's know let's know this RPE. And also in some like blindness disease, there's a, there's a functional, uh, there's a dysfunction in this RPE. So at these conditions, uh, these applied applications, then uh, opsins that bind into to 11 cis, uh, to the all trans retina will be, will be a very nice option. So for this dissociation of the chromophone with the opsin, it's, it's also called, called the bleaching. It's like when the light is hitting, hitting the, the, the retinas and very strong light and very strong light or with very long time, then the photoreceptor were like bleaching because all like all this chromophore will dissociate and the eyes cannot function and it needs some need some recover and recycle then to recover back to the normal functional of these photoreceptors. And there's some options uh by stop bistable opsins, and this is not in case for the vertebrae type opsin, like a rod, rod opsin or cone rod opsins. So for vertebrae types of opsins, there's only, there's only one like directions, it binds into elements, then capture the light, then becomes active. But it's not in this case at the vertebrae type of opsin. In vertebrate opsins at the resting state, it can either bind in the advanced retinal or all trans retinal. And then there are some conformation change between this inactive conformation, active conformation and inactive conformation with a different, with, with different um, the photons, the wavelengths of the photons. So in this figure D, it shows that, that at the resting state, like um, this, um, these opsins can bind in 11 cis retinal or all trans retinal. And if this retina was uh, like a shedding light with the ultraviolet, the UV light, then its absorption spectrums were more close to the all trans retinal. And in a dark status, it was more close to 11 cis, the inactive status, or after like shedding with the yellow light, then it will cause like, like these patterns will go back to the dark status and the inactivated status that applied into the elements like this and these patterns. So this image is called Fred Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. So generally it shows, it produces a profile of a sample. Just we can see here that 
the profile of the UV light with the dark is more close with the dot line that's the UV line then plus with yellow light. That's what go back to the dark condition. But it's dramatically different from like the, the yellow light then, then with the UV light stimulation. And the whole like like these lines behaviors were different between these between these the two uh, status. So now we know that like the UV light, yellow light first go back yellow light and go back to inactive state, then turn it on to UV light into active state, and and the whole absorptance spectrum so were completely different from the inactivate status. So here, we will discuss uh, um, some um, characteristic property of this opsin that binding to GQ and activate the PLC signal pathway. And this G protein is a uh, sorry, it is opsin from a jump spider. And so when we zoom in, uh, we can see that in this R type of photoreceptor, after capture right, and it will becomes. And then you will dissociate the G protein, the GQ, then the alpha subunit will bind in the two uh, gamma subunit of the PLC. And this can switch it to an active state, then can open the TRP channel. TRP channel is a cation channel, then can cause the sodium and calcium fluxing. So they, from this jumping spider obscene paper and that published in 2019 and the, in the ground state and the photo product state. And then we can see that the overall the composition of the chromophones are, are different. So like for the, for, the, for the ground state, most of them are nice. But for the photo for the, for the and then you switch all to the all trans, all trans retinas. So all trans retinas is in its activate state, and the activate state it will bind into the nicest or eleven cis. But in this, for for this absence, it's a nicest. Again, it's a absorb absorption spectrum pattern, and we can see that um, this. Absorption patterns were different between the ground state and the photo product state. That's because this lines is like it's like a characteristic uh like like the pattern of this all trans retina, but and this blue light and blue line is a shows the nicest chromophore. So for this for this um, jumping spider of scenes, it has a two state. One is the ground state, another is the matter rhodopsin equilibrium state. And what is interesting that, of course, one thing that when the switch, the condition of the ground state to the, the activated equilibrium state, it requires a photon. And the decay of this activated state go back to, to the rest state requires another photon. So this demonstrates a very typical bistable photon, it means that it's open, requires photon. It's close, it's shut down, requires another photon. But um, what is unique is here that this most sensitive the wavelengths are same between this ground state and this an activated equilibrium state. And we're talking about that later because it will show that at, at, the, at, at the final condition. So that's easy here, that this wavelengths were, were same, but the intermediate like a status, the wavelengths are a little different. Something like blue shift, then go back to the equilibrium state, it was a red shift. So we can see this as a, so this x x x axis is at the time as the time goes by. So the first adoption was a decrease. So this does decrease. And what is increased is like this lumen is increased, the mass is increased. But 
finally, and all of these conditions will go will go to like enrich into this equilibrium state. Also, is a five thirty five nanometer mass sensitive, so it will go to this. Uh, this red line that the most absorptions are coming from this status and other intermediate like status will be decreased. So again, it shows like this, then first this basal increase, then decrease, then the second wave is the lumen, like an increase, decrease, then switch the, to the meso, increase, decrease, then, then go back to, then, Go forward to an activate equilibrium state and that should a meta setters then go to equilibrium status. So let's uh, let's uh, like from one state to another state and at this state it's a quite like stable among some of the time. But this stability can be uh, decayed or be abrupt or stopped by another photon. So in this image, and it shows a quantum efficiency. So in this figure, like most efficient is show in the, in the upper left in this box. So in this box, we can see that the most efficient way is during when this quantum efficiency is at 0.4 to 0.5. And this is the active, is the meta state. That's uh, uh, go back when you see that's the meta state and the meta rhodopsin equilibrium state. That at this state, then it's more efficient. So here I'm going to like discuss about the quantum efficiency. It's when we think about it, we can think about the camera CCD. It's a kind of like evaluation, how efficient of this device that can transform like one energy type, the light or the photon to the potential change to the electrical signal change. So that's, it's an efficiency. Oh, it's called, it's like an energy conversion efficiency. And the most efficient is showing this box and it's 0 0.5, 0 0.4. So it's in the major activate status and that is the most efficient um, uh, status for this. Uh, for these options. So we can see that in this decade requires 60 microseconds. And it's just the same we can see here. That's how we get this result. That's the speed of its decade condition. Now how it changed from like a very high efficient like equilibrium activated state to go back to ground state, it requires a 60 minus seconds. It's just, it get this result from this analyze of the quantum efficiency. And this result is coming from this paper. So for let's move on to see some other options that are coupled to GI. For the GI coupled options, could function as an effective axon inhibitory tool because it coupled GI activate the GI signal pathway and it will cause a second GMP decrease and it will also activate the GRIK. This is a potassium channel and it will cause the hyperpolarization because the potassium can go out, flux out of the cell and cause hyperpolarization. And it can also inhibit uh, the voltage gated calcium channel and it will inhibit the, the neurotransmitter release. So it's uh, quite um, optimal and inhibitory tools. So here we do discuss about the structure of the GRRK potassium channel. GRRK potassium channel is a kind, a kind of attachment and at the intracellular part, it can bind into the G protein. So in this image, it only shows a beta gamma uh, subunit, but actually like, it, like everything is coming together. Also with the alpha subunit. 
So because it's attached mirror, so each channels can bind into four G beta uh, subunit. So so these diagrams come in from another from another studies, and then here it shows a diagram. It shows that it has um, a transmembrane domain, and C terminal is inside the cytosol, and then it's all now it's in, in a closed state. And it's binding to beta subunit. And here it shows a G protein coupled receptor, and then we can see that the characteristic, the seven transmembrane domain, and it's uh, closely binding with a G protein, and this is the alpha subunit. So here is the closed state, and we can see that alpha subunit, beta, and gamma subunit are all together. And after I like, like, capture by light, then the conformation change of of this this uh, opsin, then it will cause a conformation change and the functional change of the alpha subunit. Then it will discard the GDP and the binding with the GTP. And this conformation change will cause will cause like they will cause the effect or to the status of the GIRK potassium channel. And this GIRK potassium channel is opened and let's uh, let's, uh, let's pour, let's uh, open up that then the potassium can flux out of the cell. So this, um, so different like the conformation structure and, and abiding the force of the shiver base between the transretina and the west the um sorry the elevated retina of the cone opsin were different from that of the rod opsin. So in this review, they also they also uh, talking about that this uh um, property that determine the function of the of kinetics of the cone opsin. So cone, cone pigment opsin has a, a faster of kinetics uh, comparing to the rod opsin. So you mentioned that that in this article. So next in this uh, review, let discuss about a GS coupled opsin that are taken from a jellyfish. This jellyfish opsin is binding to G GS and it causes the increase of the cyclin AMP. You can open the CNG channel, HCN channel, and cause the depolarization. Also activate protein kinase A, then activate the voltage gated calcium channels. So um, in this toolbox, another way is that like forming a chimera that cut off the intracellular part of the G-protein coupled receptor, then, then, then change or replace the, the intracellular part of the opsin. Then can this newly generated um, chimera, uh, rather, than, rather than it responds to the ligand binding of the, of the traditional G-protein coupled receptor, it switch to uh, like can be controlled by light. So this light will change the conformation of the intracellular part, then cause like the interaction with the G protein is being changed. So most uh, uh, successful and very famous is a, a drug, a beta, uh, two adrenergic receptors um, um, engineered um, optogenetics tools and it can be controlled when it's pressed on the heart muscle and it can be controlled by light to change like the, um, the function or the performance or behavior of the muscle cell because it, its function is like the beta adrenergic receptors and like it. So this shows that um, instead of previous ligand, then this optical is extra like beta two receptors that can control its functions with the light. So go back to the earliest uh, opsins we're talking, and today that's that's opsin that's from the jumping spider, and that's an R-type photoreceptor. 
and that's a uh, binding with the GQ. So this GQ can also function as an excitatory uh, optogenic torus here. Also, it's like this. It's a GQ coupled, and it can be controlled by the light by the light, and activate the PLC and open the calcium channel or TRP channels. So there's other other like a potential tours like a peropsin or opin L1, and they're very like uh be attractive because they're binding to the all trans retina as a as a ligand, then it could be a potential tools for the optogenetics. So thank you, and that's all for today.